All right, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the documented evidence of Mansa Musa with no additions, meaning nothing added to any of the stories. We're going to read the actual documents from the sources and let the documents do all of the talking. After reading each source, I'm going to make a quick observation and then move forward. If you have any questions, just let me know and we can go into detail. The sources include Al Sadie, the Katie family, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Butad, and Al Umari. This is very text heavy, so without any more delay, let's jump right in. Observation Sultan Kankan Musa was the first Sultan to rule Songhai. He was the just and pious man, whom none of the Ultan Sultans of Mali equaled in such qualities. He made the pilgrimage to the sacred house of God, the part in God knows best in the early years of the 8th century. He set off in great pomp with the large party, including 60,000 soldiers and 500 slaves, who ran in front of him as he rode. Each of the slaves bore in his hand a wand fashioned from 500 mythicals of gold. He took the route through Relata, which is in the upper lands and through the location of Tuwait. Many of his party stayed behind in Tuwait because of a foot ailment, which befell them on the journey and settled there. The foot ailment was called Tuwait in their language, and so the place was named after it. Now, you know those numbers are impossible. The, logistically speaking, it, it's just sure impossible for you to have that many people and that many animals to go across the desert at the exact same time. This is just a, a case of exaggeration. I'm not going to do this the whole time, but it's just clear exaggeration. The Easterners who chronicled his visit were astonished at how mighty a ruler he was. However, they did not characterize him as generous or open-handed. Since despite the great size of his kingdom, he gave out no more than 20,000 metricals of gold as charity at the two holy places, compared with the 100,000 metricals which Askiya al Haj Muhammad had donated. After he went on pilgrimage, the Songhai folk submitted to his authority. On his return journey, he followed a route which passed through their territory, and he built a mosque and a prayer niche outside the town of Gia. Celebrating the Friday prayer therein as was his custom in every town where he spent a Friday. The mosque is still there to this day. Upon reaching Timbuktu, he took possession of it. He was the first ruler to do so and left one of his lieutenants behind there. Kankan Musa also built a palace in Timbuktu, which was called Mandugu, meaning the palace of the Sultan in their language. Its location is still known but it has become a slaughtering place for the butchers. Abu Abdullah Muhammad Ibn Butada, may God most high have mercy on him, said in his travels, when Sultan Mansa Musa, that is, Malikor Kankan Musa, made the pilgrimage, he lodged in a villa at Burkhid al-Habesh, outside Cairo that belonged to Saraj al-Din Ibn al -Kuwek, a great Alexandrian merchant. This was where the Sultan stayed, being in need of some money, he borrowed it from this Siraj al-Din, as did his lieutenants. Siraj al-Din sent an agent of his along with them to collect a debt, but the agent stayed in Mali. Then Siraj al-Din himself went to collect the debt, accompanied by one of his sons. Upon reaching Timbuktu, they were offered hospitality by Abu Hashek al-Sahili, but it was Siraj al-Din's fate to die that night, and people gossiped about this and suspected that he had been poisoned. But his son said to them, I ate exactly the same food as he did. If it had been poisoned, it would have killed both of us. It was simply that his allotted lifespan came to an end. His son went on to Mali, collected the debt, and returned to the Egyptian domains. And the same work Ibn Butada also says, In this city, i.e. Timbuktu, is the tomb of this Abu Hashek, who is an outstanding Grenadian poet known in his homeland as al Tawajin, the small casserole. There is also the tomb of the aforementioned Siraj al-Din. Here ends what Abu Butada said. It was in the year 1353. Though God knows best that the author of the travels to seek Abu Abdullah, Allah visit Timbuktu. It is said that Kankan Musa was the one who built the tower minaret of the great mosque which still stands. During the period of Malian rule, the Sultan of Masse set out for Timbuktu at the head of a large army. The Malians fled in fear 
and abandoned the city to them. The Masi Sultan entered Timbuktu and sacked and burned it, killing many persons and looting it before returning to his land. Then the Malians went back to the city and ruled it for a farther hundred years. The learned scholar and jurist Ahmed Baba, may God most high have mercy upon him, said, Timbuktu has been sacked three times. The first time it was at the hand of the Sultan of Masi, the second at the hand of Sunni Ali, and the third at the hand of Pasha Mahmoud Ibn Zakwan, which was less severe than the first two. The bloodshed during Sunni Ali's sack of the city is said to have been greater than that occasion by the ruler of Masse. Toward the end of Malian rule, the Saharan Tuareg under their Sultan Akil began to raid and cause havoc on all sides. The Malians, bewildered by their many depredations, refused to make a stand against them. The Tuareg said, The Sultan who does not defend his territory has no right to rule it. So the Malians abandoned Timbuktu and returned to Mali. The aforementioned Akil ruled Timbuktu for 40 years. All right, on some quick observations, we have clear numerical exaggeration with a huge number of people who accompany Mansa Musa. We know for a fact that the logistics and provisions don't support such a large number of people moving across the desert at the same time. Also, we have the discrimination of non-Muslim invasion versus the Muslim invasion. And what I mean by that is, when referring to the second of Timbuktu, he mentions the Masi who came in the 14th century on multiple occasions in 1339 and 1343 and again right before the Sunni dynasty. He then mentions Sunni Ali, who the Chronicles despised, as Sunni Ali was a nominal Muslim and drew on his powers from his non-Muslim ancestors. And this was something that Skia Muhammad complained about. Finally, he says the second by Pasha Mahmoud Ibn Zakwan was less severe. But this is the attack which effectively brought to the end of the classical African civilization and unified control. Pasha Mahmoud was sent by al Dhabi, the king of Morocco. This is the invasion of the Moors, who were Spaniards, a.k.a. Europeans, all under the false pretenses of unifying Islam. However, this was all the sham, and the great Ahmed Baba confronted the king about his false claims and the sacking of his town. Anyways, I digress. I will talk about that more when I talk about the fall of Africa in another up-and-coming presentation. Is there anything missing or strange from what we've gathered so far? We are now going to recount a portion of what we have been able to learn on the subject of the Mali court, Kan Kan Musa. This Mali court was a virtuous, pious, and devout king. His power extended to the far frontiers of Mali Tor, Sibiridugu, and all the populations that inhabited this territory acknowledged his authority, including the Songhai. One of the proofs of his virtue was that he freed one slave during each day of his rule. He made the Hajj to the sacred abode of God, and during the time of his pilgrimage, he built the Grand Mosque of Timbuktu, as well as the ones in Dekuri, Gandam, Deri, Wanko, and Bako. The mother of Kankan Musa was an indigenous woman, although some say that she was of Arab origin. The reason why Kankan Musa made the Hajj to Mecca was recounted to me as follows by the Talib Muhammad Kuma, may God have mercy upon him, who was thoroughly steeped in the traditions of the ancients. The Malikor Kankan Musa, I was told, experienced terrible pain and extreme remorse later in his life because he had accidentally killed his mother, Nana Kankan. Fearing punishment for his faults, he gave away enormous sums of money throughout his life, both in arms and on behalf of those who fasted. One of the ulamas of his time, to whom he asked how he could receive pardon for this horrible crime, told him, It is my opinion that you should seek refuge near the messenger of God. May God bestow his blessings upon him and grant him to salvation. You must hasten to him. You must hasten to be near him and place yourself under his protection. Pray that he will intercede with God on your behalf, and that God will accept his intercession. That is my advice. That very day, Kan Kan Musa decided that he would put his plan into motion, accepting all ensuing financial obligations and immediately making preparations for his journey. He notified the inhabitants of the empire from far and wide that he would need food and other subsidies. 
Then he approached one of his wise men and beseeched him to make a day that he should begin his journey. The sheikh told him, You must wait for a Saturday that falls on the twelfth day of the month. This is the day for you to leave, so that you will not die before returning to your house safe and sound, God willing. The prince therefore put off his departure, watching and waiting for the coming of this day in the months that followed. It was only nine months later that the twelfth day of the month happened to fall on a Saturday. The emperor, who was staying at his palace in Mali, therefore set forth on his journey the same day the head of his caravan had already reached Timbuktu. From this time forward, travelers in the land consider it a happy omen to take to the road on any Saturday that falls on the twelfth day of the month. This is why whenever a traveler returns in a sorry state, one cites the proverb, here is a man who did not leave his house on the Saturday that the Mali court chose for his departure. Kankan -Kan Musa took to the road with powerful forces, bringing vast songs with him and leading an enormous army. Some students of our master told us that he asked the very lead judge, Abu al Abbas, Sidi Ahmed, Aben Ahmed, Aben, and Ak Muhammad, may God have mercy on him. May he be satisfied with him and bear witness to his satisfaction. How many persons accompanied the Pasha Ali Aben Abid Akadar on the day that he left for Tuwait, declaring his intentions to take the Hajj to Mecca? He was told that the Pasha's army had consisted of about 80 men. After proclaiming the greatness of God and praising him, he then said, All things in this world are transitory. When Kan Kan Musa departed on the Hajj to Mecca, he brought with him 8,000 men. The Askiya Muhammad, who took the Hajj later, brought only of a tenth of that number, that is, 800. The last of these, Ali Ibn Abdul al Qadar, who went much later, brought only 80, the tenth of 800. Then he added, yet even he safely returned, thanks to the supreme being who alone is all powerful. Meanwhile, Kan Kan Musa began his journey, a subject that has inspired many tales and anecdotes. However, common sense dictates that the majority of these tales are not trustworthy. For instance, he is said to have built a mosque each time he passed through a town on Friday as he journeyed from the Sudan to Egypt. It is commonly asserted that the mosques of the towns of Gundam and Dakuri were among those that were built in this way. It is also said that from the day that he left his palace until the moment of his journey's end, he ate nothing but freshly cooked fish and vegetables, both at lunchtime and for dinner. I have also been told that Kan Kan Musa brought with him his wife, who was named Inari Kante who was also accompanied by 500 other women in her servants. One day they stopped to set up camp in the middle of the desert between Tuwait and Tagaza. That night Inari Kante tried to make herself comfortable in the tent of her husband, who slept next to her. Later he awoke and saw that she had not yet fallen asleep. He then asked her, you're not sleeping, what's the matter? She gave no answer and remained awoke until midnight. The prince woke up once again to find that she was still awake. Invoking the name of God, he asked her to tell him what had ailed her. Nothing, she responded, except that my body is filthy from all the dirt. I want the river, i.e. Niger River, so I can bathe, dive, swim, and frolic about in the water. Do you have the power to bring such a thing to me? Agitated by these words, Kan Kan Musa got up from his bed at once and sat cross-legged upon the ground. After long reflection, he ordered that Faber, the Grand Chief, the appointed overseer of his slaves and retinue, be brought before him. Thus summoned, Faber presented himself before the prince and offered the greetings due to a sovereign. For this act of obeisance, the custom involved lifting one's tunic, draping oneself in it, and then bowing low to the ground. Then one would beat upon one's breast before falling to one's knees. In all the empire, the Kadi alone enjoyed the privilege of offering his hand to the sovereign. The title of the Kadi was Anfar Kuma, Kuma being the name of the clan from all the Kadis came. 
and Alfaro being spoken in place of the word Katie, which was then unknown. After Farber performed his act of obeisance, the prince said to him, O oh, Farber, from the day that I first married this woman here, she has asked me for nothing that was not in my power to give her, nothing that did not exist at some place in my empire or that was impossible for me to provide. But tonight she has asked me to create a flowing river out of nothing, right here in the middle of the desert. At the moment, we are two weeks march from any river. God, the one and only, has the power to create such a thing in this place. As for me, I am powerless. Let us hope, Father replied, that God will arrange things accordingly. His eyes brimming with tears and beating himself upon his breast, Farber took his leave of the prince and returned to his campsite. There he brought together the slaves who were assembled before him in the blink of an eye. They were 8,700 slaves, according to Baba and Sara Mondeo of the town of Janae. But according to another source, there were exactly 9,000 slaves. Farber distributed a hoe to each one of them, then walking off a thousand steps, he implored them to till the soil the entire length of his footsteps. They plowed the ground, throwing back the loose dirt until they reached a depth that was equal to the height of three men. Once it has been accomplished, Farber gave them order for them to fill the entire length of the ditch with sand and then rocks. On top of these, they placed wood stumps, and above these, they arranged balls of karite. Then they lit a fire which melted the balls of karite above the rocks and the sand breaking them up and forming a coating along the surface of the ditch that was now as smooth as the varnish of pottery. Then Farber ordered them to bring out the water skins, big and small, and to open the mouths of the water skins, and to allow the water to flow freely into, di into the ditch. The water was poured in little by little, causing it to swell and rise until it moved in waves and swirls like those at a big river. When Farber presented himself once again to the Kankan Musa, he found him seated on the ground next to his wife. They had both been awakened by the violent crackling of the flames and the billowing smoke. After greeting the prince as was the custom, Farber said to him, Sir, God has come to your aid and has soothed your worries. Whereas Anari, let her come forth, now that God has given you the power to create a river and a place, thanks to the one who is never far from you on your heart. The messenger of God, may God bestow his blessings upon him and grant him salvation. At this moment, the sun rose in the sky and night came to an end. The princess, accompanied by the 500 women, climbed at once upon her mule and rode off for the river. Once there, these women became radiant and joyful, pushing and shoving their ways toward the river. With cries of happiness, they descended into the water and washed themselves. And it was, when it was time to leave, the water in this ditch was drawn and preserved. Sim and Bun and Nahate also accompanied the prince on his journey. He was the servant who rode his horse before the caravan at the head of a large group. One day when these men were overcome by thirst, they happened upon one of those wells, dug in the midst of the desert's emptiness. As they drew up the water, they could see their own reflection. One of them lowered the bucket, which was tied to a rope, but as he drew the water up, the, water, the rope snapped. The same thing happened with the second and a third bucket, so they surmised that someone must be cutting the ropes. Down of thirst, they cried it over the, the edge of the well, not sure what to do next. Then Sim and Bana Nahati rolled his shirt sleeves into ropes, tucked his sword under one arm, and descended alone into the well. The others waited for him at the edge of the well in terrible anxiety. At the bottom of the well there was a brigand. This thief had come upon the well before them and hoped to make them all die of thirst so that he might climb out from his hiding place and steal their goods. He did not believe that anyone would be brave enough to attack him in this place. Sim and Bana Mahati nonetheless killed him and then he tossed up the rope from the bucket so that the body of the dead man might be pulled to the surface. After dragging him out, they later threw him back into the well. My master, the Mori, Bukhar bin Salid the Wangarbi, God have mercy upon him, told me that Kankan Musa brought 40 mirrors loaded with gold when he made his hajj to Mecca, 
and that he visited the tomb of the prophet. It is certain that he asked the sheikh of the noble and holy town of Mecca, may God the most high protect it, to entrust him with two, three, or four noblemen who were descendants of the messenger of God. May God bestow his blessings upon him and grant to him salvation, as the sight of such persons will bestow blessings upon the inhabitants of the empire, as with the footprints they left in the sand. But the sheikh refused him, the unanimous opinion being that one must formally oppose such a thing because of the high regard due to the noble blood of the Sharifs, none of whom should be allowed to, to fall into the hands of the infidel. This is pure become lost. However, as the prince persisted in making his request, even vehemently insisting upon it, so the sheikh finally said to him, I will not abet such a thing, nor will I order anyone to do so, but neither will I forbid it. As for those who wish to follow you, let them do as they please. I will have no part of this. Thus, it was that the Malikor made the following announcement known through one of his heralds in the mosque of Mecca. Whoever wished to have 1,000 mythicals of gold shall follow me to my country. This sum will be paid to him immediately. In this way, he succeeded in attracting 40 men from the tribe of the Quraysh, but some who were only free slaves belonging to this tribe pretended that they were born with the authentic Quraishite stamp. He made these return 4,000 mythicals, a thousand for each of them. When it was time to return to his country, the Quraishites and their families followed him. Upon their arrival at Timbuktu at the end of his voyage, the Malikor assembled the boats and perigos to transport his wives, as well as the families and baggage of the Quraishites, to the land of Mali. As the flotilla was too small to transport the horsemen, the perigos carried the nobles and the prince from the noble city of Mecca. When they came to the town of Kami, the Genikor and the Quran assailed the flotilla, pillaging all its goods. They forced the nobles to debark and claimed that they were in revolt against the Malikor. However, they learned the history of these nobles and their house station from the boat captains. They formally introduced themselves and treated them with great honor, furnishing them with dwellings in a nearby place called Chin Chin. Some claimed that the nobles of the town of K or K descended from these Karashites. Thus concludes the account of the journey of the Hajj of the Malikor Kankan Musa. As for the Janaikor, he was one of the most humble servants of the Malikor and one of his lowest officials. To give you an account of his worth, it should suffice us to note that he was admitted only in the presence of the Malikor's wife. It was to her that he would present the taxes of the region of Janai, as he never saw the Malikor. Thanks be to the one who honors and humbles, who rises up and brings low. Alright, now the rest of this chapter is just dealing with the observation of the Empire of Mali. I'm just going to give you a couple of the notable items and then we're going to keep on moving. If you ask what difference there is between the Malinke and the Wangara, know that the Wangara and the Malinke come from the same origin. But Malinke is used to designate the warriors, whereas Wangara is used to designate the merchants who peddle goods from land to land. Malike is an expression used by the Fulani of Messina in the Timbuktu region to refer to the inhabitants of Mali. The Fulani of Senegal sometimes use the same word and sometimes the variant Mandinke, although the inhabitants of Mali use the word Mandinka to refer to themselves. It is said that Mali encompasses a region of 400 towns and that its soil is extremely rich. Among the kingdoms of the sovereigns of the world, only the lands of Syria surpass it in beauty. Its inhabitants are rich and live very well. It suffices to give some idea of its wealth, to make reference to the gold mines and plantations of the Gura, which can be found there and which have no parallel in all the Tekoa, except in the land of Burgo, north of modern day Benin. Some more quick observations. Authors, and I say authors because evidence points to the Fatouche having multiple authors, mostly the Katie family, and we know for a fact the manuscripts were tampered with later on by Amadou Lobo, or some of you know of him as Siku Amadou of the Messina Empire. Now back on topic, they don't flush out their thoughts completely, which is a problem I myself have if you read any of my writings. We just seem to jump from subject to subject without completing the prior one. Perfect example, are we to take everything that was stated to us as not trustworthy? Again, I ask you, is there anything missing or strange?
The kingdom of the Sudan in the desert of the Maghrib in the first and second climes was divided among many nations of the Sudan. The first among them, nearest to the Atlantic, was a nation called Susu. Some places called Soso. They ruled over Ghana and embraced Islam at the time of the conquest. The author of the Book of Roger about geography says that the Banu Salu of the Banu Abdullah Ibn Hussein established their dynasty in a powerful kingdom, but we have failed to confirm it beyond that. Sali of the descendants of Hussein is unknown. The people of Ghana denied that they had any rule over them except the Susu. Then east of the Susu, there is the nation of Mali whose capital, capital is the town of this unknown place. Then farther to the east is the nation of Kaukau or Gio, then Tukwar. Between the Tukwar and Danuba is the nation of Kanim and others. So let me give you a little insight on this word Tukwar and outside authorship, especially Arabic authorship. This word Tukwar and this, this location Tukwar is located in different places to many different authors. Some places is to the east, some places to the west. Sometimes it's everything below the desert. It's just this this real place that's, that's really unknown to people that's outside or not from the actual location. So you got to be careful with their word. Conditions changed with the passing of time and the people of Mali took possession of the country, which is beyond and before them of the lands of Susu and Kaukau or Gio. The last country that they conquered was the land of Tukwa. The kingdom became extremely powerful and their town of unknown place became the capital of the land of the Sudan in the west. They embraced Islam long ago when some of their kings performed a pilgrimage. Now remember in the first presentation I told you the Islam that you see today did not exist back then. As far as them proclaiming Islam, the extent of that was just saying that you are Muslim. Friday prayer and going on hard. Other than that, there was no praying five times a day. There was no following Islamic law. There was none of that going on back then. The first among them to do so was Barmandara. I have heard from some of their eminent men that they pronounce his name Barmandana. The kings after him followed his example in performing the pilgrimage. Then Masawali, son of Marijada, went on the pilgrimage during the reign of Azahir of Babars. The next one among them on the pilgrimage was Safkara, their free slave who had usurped their kingship. It was he who conquered the town of Gio. Then he went on the pilgrimage during the reign of Al Nasir. After him, Mansa Musa made the pilgrimage, as is recounted in their history in dealing with the Berber dynasty. In the account of the Sahanja and the dynasty of the Lamtuna, one of their people, or one of the people of the Sahanja. When Mount Samusa left the land of the Maghrib for the pilgrimage, he followed the desert route and came out near the pyramids in Egypt. He sent a rich present to Al Nasir. It is said that it included 50,000 dinars. Al Nasir accommodated him at Al Khwaifa, a Kabara, and gave it to him as a fief. The Sultan received him in his audience room, talked to him, gave him a gift and supplied him provisions. He gave him horses and camels and sent along with him emirs to serve him until he performed his religious duty in the year 1324. On his return journey in the Hajis, he was stricken by a disaster from which his faith rescued him. It is so happened that on the way he strayed from the Mahmir and the caravan was left alone with his people away from the Arabs. This route was completely unknown to them and they could not find a way to a settlement or come upon a watering place. They went toward the horizon until they came out as a weeds. They were eating fish whenever they could find some, and the Bedouin were snatching up the stragglers until they were saved. Then the Sultan again bestowed honors upon him and was generous in his gifts. It is said that he had prepared in his country for his expenses a hundred load of gold, each load wearing three quintars. This was all exhausted, and he could not meet his expenses. He therefore borrowed money from the principal merchants. Among those merchants who were in his company were the Benu at Kuwait, who gave him a loan of 50,000 dinars. He sold to them the palace which the Sultan had bestowed on him as a gift. He, the Sultan, approved of it. Siraj al-Din al-Bin al 
sent his wazir along with him to collect what he had loaned to him. But the wazir died there. So Raj al-Din sent another emissary with his son. He, the emissary, died, but the son, Fakh al-Din Abu Jafar, got back some of it. Mansa Musa died before he, Saraj al then died, so they obtained nothing more from him. So this is account is a conflicting report from the earlier report, saying that they got some money back from Mansa Musa. But on this one, they didn't get all of their money back from Mansa Musa. When Africa and the Maghreb were conquered by the Arabs, merchants penetrated the western part of the land of the Sudan and found among them no king greater than the king of Ghana. Ghana was bounded on the west by the ocean. They were a very mighty people exercising vast authority. The seat of their authority was Ghana, a dual city on both banks of the Nile, one of the greatest and most populous cities in the world. It is mentioned by the authors of the Book of Raja, al Idrisi, and the Book of Routes and Rams, Al-Bukhari. Now the Nile is just the Niger River. The neighbors of Ghana on the east, as chroniclers assert, were another people known as Susu or Susus, and beyond them another known as Mali, and beyond them another known as Kaukau or Kagu, then beyond them another known as Tukwar. I learned from Sheikh Uthman, the faith of the people of Ghana and one of their chief men and the most learned religious and celebrated of them, whom I met when he came to Egypt in 1394 in the course of the pilgrimage with his family that they called the Tukwa Zeke and the Mali and Kara. Later the authority of the people of Ghana waned and their prestige declined as that of the Vale people of the Amorites. Their neighbors on the north next to the land of the Berbers grew. These extended their domination over the Sudan and pillaged and imposed tribute and poll tax and converted many of them to Islam. Then the authority of the rulers of Ghana dwindled away and they were overcome by the Susu, a neighboring people of the Sudan who subjugated and absorbed them. Later, the people of Mali outnumbered the people of the Sudan in their neighborhood and dominated the whole region. They vanquished the Susu and acquired all their possessions both their ancient kingdom and that of Ghana as far as the ocean on the west. They were Muslims. It is said that the first of them to embrace Islam was a king named Bamandana, who made the pilgrimage and was followed in this practice by the kings after him. Their greatest king, he who overcome the Susu, conquered their country and seized the power from their hands, was named Mary Jada. Mary in their language means ruler of the blood royal, and Jada means lion. The word for Hafid a servant or son-in-law is TKN, it's an unknown word. I have not heard the genealogy of this king. He ruled for 25 years, according to what they relate. And when he died, his son Masawali ruled after him. So basically, this is the story of uh, Sanjata, the Lion King of Mali. You should read the epic if you haven't. But continuing on. In their language, Mansa means Sultan, and Wali means Ali. This Mansa Wali was one of the greatest kings. He made the pilgrimage in the days of Azahir, Baybars. His brother Wati ruled after him, and then a third brother, Khalifa. Khalifa was insane and devoted to archery and used to shoot arrows at his people and kill them wantonly. So they rose against him and killed him. He was succeeded by Sipt, son of a daughter of Mary Jada, called Abu Bakr, who was the son of his daughter. They made him king according to the custom of these non-Arabs who bestowed a kingship on the sister and the son of the sister of a former king. We do not know his or his pedigree or his father's pedigree. Their next ruler was one of their clients who usurped their kingship. His name was Sepkara, pronounced Sepkara by the people of Ghana and their language. According to Sheikh Ufman, Sepkara performed a pilgrimage during the reign of Amalik al Nasir and was killed while on the return journey at Tajara. During his mighty reign, their dominions expanded. They overcame the neighboring peoples. He conquered the land of Gio and brought it within the rule of the people of Mali. Their rule reached from the ocean and Ghana in the west to the land of Tokwa in the east. Their authority became mighty and all the people of the Sudan stood in awe of them. Merchants from the Maghreb and Africa traveled to their country. al Yunus, the Takari interpreter, said that the conqueror of Kaukau was Sakamanzah 
one of the generals of Mansa Musa. The ruler after this Sakara was Q, grandson of the Sultan Marijata. Then after him, his son Muhammad Ibn Q. After him, the kingship passed from the land of Marijata to that of his brother Abu Bakr and the person of Mansa Musa Ibn Abu Bakr. Mansa Musa Ibn Abu Bakr. Mansa Musa was an upright man and a great king, and tales of his justice are still told. He made the pilgrimage in 1324 and encountered during the ceremonies the Andalusian poet Abu Ashek Ibrahim al Sahili, known as Al Tawajin. Abu Ashek accompanied Mansa Musa to his country and there enjoyed an esteem and consideration which his descendants have inherited after him and keep to this day. They are settled in Walatin on the western frontier of their country. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you just witnessed was the king list of Mali, and I will give you a visual of it in a, in a few moments. On his return journey, Mansa Musa was met by our friend al Mulama, Abdullah ibn Khadijah Akuma, a descendant of Abdullah al Mulaman, or the Almahad ruler. Muammar had been a propagandist in the Zeb for the expected Fatima, and had made raids upon the inhabitants of the Zeb with guerrilla bands of Arabs. The ruler of Wargalan had captured him by a ruse, but released him after a time and he set off through the wilderness to seek help from Mansa Musa forces to avenge himself. Having heard that Mansa Musa had set off on a pilgrimage, he stayed to wait for him in the town of Gatherments, in hope of obtaining help against his enemy and support for his mission because of the power of Mansa Musa authority and the desert adjacent to the territory of Wargalan. Uh, Mulema, a truthful man, told me, we used to keep the Sultan company during his progress. I and Abu Ashek are Tawajin, to the exclusion of his visors and chief men, and converse to his enjoyment. At each halt, he would regale us with rare foods and confectionery. His equipment and furnishings were carried by 12,000 private slave women wearing gowns of brocade and Yemeni silk. According to al Haj Yunus, the interpreter for this nation at Cairo, this man, Mansa Musa, came from his country with 80 loads of gold dust, each load wearing three kintars. In their own country, they used only slave women and men for transport, but for distant journeys, such as the pilgrimage, they have mounts. Even Khadija continues, we returned with him to the capital of his kingdom. He wished to acquire a house as the seat of his authority, solidly constructed and clothed with plaster on account of it being unknown in their land. So Abu Ashek al Tawijin made something novel for him by erecting a square building with a dome. He had a good knowledge of handicrafts and lavished all his skill on it. He plastered it over and, and covered, with, covered it with colored patterns so that it turned out to be the most elegant of buildings. It caused the Sultan great astonishment because of the ignorance of the art building in their land, and he rewarded Abu Ashek for it with 12,000 mythicals of gold dust apart from the preference favor and splendid gifts which he enjoyed. There were diplomatic relations and exchanges of gifts between this Sultan Mansa Musa and the contemporary Marinid king of the Maghreb, Sultan Abu Hussein. High-ranking statesmen of the two kingdoms were exchanged as ambassadors. The ruler of the Maghreb chose with care such products and novelties of his kingdom as people spoke of for long after and sent them by the hand of Ali Ibn Ghanim, the emir of the Maghreb and other dignitaries of his state. The successors of these two monarchs inherited these relations, as will be mentioned. Now there's wisdom behind this, man. You should never accept gifts from another man. There's wisdom behind it. I, I'll explain it more when I get to ask you, Muhammad. But you should never accept gifts from another man, especially another king. The reign of this Mansa Musa lasted for 25 years. On his death, his son, Mansa Maga, succeeded him as ruler of Mali. Maga with them means Muhammad. Mansa Maga died within four years of succeeding and was followed by Mansa Suleiman, the son of Abu Bakr, who was Mount Musa's brother. His reign lasted 24 years. Then he died and his son, Kesa or Kusa, the son of Solomon, succeeded him only to die nine months after succession. After him ruled Mary Jada, the son of Mansa Maga, the son of Mansa Musa whose reign lasted 14 years. He was a most wicked ruler over them because of the tortures, tyrannies, and improprieties to which he subjected them. In 1360, 
he presented to the king of the Maghrib at that time the Sultan Abu Slim, son of Sultan Abu Hassan, the gifts which are often mentioned, among which was that huge creature which provoked astonishment in the Maghrib, known as the giraffe. The people talked of it for long because of the various adornments and markings which it combined in its body and attributes. The trustworthy Katie Abu Abdullah Muhammad Abin Wasul of Salajamasa, who had settled in the land of Gio in their country and had been employed as Katie there, and whom I met at Hanayan in 1374 and 75, gave me a great deal of information about their kings, which I wrote down. He told me about this Sultan Jata, that he ruined their empire, squandered their treasure, and all but demolished the edifice of their rule. His extravagance and prolificacy, said Abu Abdullah, reached such a point that he sold the boulder of gold, which was a prized possession of their treasury. It was a boulder weighing 20 cantars, which had been transported from the mine without being worked or purified by fire. They regarded it as the most rarest and most precious of treasures because it's like it's so scarce in the mines. Jata, this prolific king, offered it to the Egyptian traders who traveled back and forth to his country, and they brought it at a dizzy price, meaning they got over. This in addition to the other royal treasures which he squandered and loose living. He was stricken by sleeping sickness, a disease which often afflicts the inhabitants of that region. Basically, the, the, the court, or the people of the court, the wisers and, or the council, they will poison you to get rid of you. Particularly, the aristocracy. The victim suffers from attacks of sleepiness at all times until he hardly wakes except for short intervals. The disease becomes chronic and the attacks are continuous until he dies. This Jata was afflicted by this disease for two years and died in 1373 or 74. They appointed his son Musa to succeed him. He adopted a way of justice and consideration towards his people and quite abandoned the way of his father. Nowadays his advice is sought, but his authority has been seized by his vizier Mary Jata. Mary Jata holds the Sultan in seclusion and has taken his power exclusively into his own hands. He has seen to the mobilization of the army and the gathering of the squadrons. He has subdued the eastern provinces of their country and passed beyond the frontiers of Gio. When he first assumed authority, he sent against Takata, which is the country of the Veil Warriors beyond Gio. Detachments which laid siege to it and invested it closely, but, went, uh, but then let it be. That is their situation at present. This Takata is 70 stages from the town of Rangala toward the southwest. Its chief, who is of the Warriors of the Veil, is known as the Sultan. The route of the pilgrims of the Sudan passes through his territory. He exchanges gifts and maintains diplomatic relations with the emirs of the Zab in Wagala. The capital of the people of Mali is the town of BNY, this is an unknown name, an extensive place with cultivated land fed by running water, very populous with brisk markets. At present, it is a station for trading caravans from the Maghreb, Africa, and Egypt, and goods are imported from all parts. We have just heard that Mansa Musa died in the year 1387. This is not the original Mansa Musa, this is his great-grandson. And that he was succeeded by his brother Mansa Maga. Mansa Maga was killed after a year or so and was succeeded by Sandeki, the husband of Musa's mother. But after a few months, he was assassinated by a member, member of Mary Jada's family. Then there came forth from the land of the pagans beyond them a man named Mahmud, related to Mansa Q, the son of Mansa Wali, the son of Mary Jada the Great, who seized power and became ruler in 1390. His title is Mansa Maga. All right, now we're going to make observations of the King's List of Mali, because I know some of you all are not paying attention, so we're going to make it visual. All right, Ibn Khaldun starts off with Mary Jala. Here's a fact. Ibn Khaldun is the first to write down the oral history of Mali's King's List. When the Western world got wind of Mali in its history in the 19th and 20th centuries, they later discovered that the oral history they were just now hearing was actually written in the 15th century by Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun is also the first to write the name Mary Jata, the name of Sanjata Kita, the king of Mali. 
Also another fact is, we know this list is accurate due to the fact that it is reinforced by Ibn Battuta who actually visited Mali during the reign of Mansa Suleiman. This is Mansa Suleiman, and this is important because we know when Ibn Battuta visited Mali, Mansa Suleiman was having an issue with one of his wives. This is a key point for you to remember momentarily. Moving forward, he says Mary Jada ruled for 25 years. That is number one on this list. After that, his son Mansa Yuli, which means Ali. He was one of the greatest kings and rare respected ruler. His brother Wafi ruled after him and then a third brother, Khalifa. Khalifa was insane and devoted to archery and used to shoot arrows at his people. This is where the story gets interesting as the people rose up against him and killed him. He was succeeded by Abu Bakr, not the mythical Abu Bakr II you may have heard of. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is both Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Butala both reported that the custom of these non-Arabs was to bestow the kingship on the sister and the sons of the sister, effectively ensuring the rulership is from someone from the royal bloodline. This is false and maybe a mix-up from some custom of the Berbers. Why? Because clearly the kingship goes to the oldest living, able-bodied male and not through the women. After this, a slave who was actually a servant in the royal court usurped the throne, meaning he possibly got rid of Abu Bakr or he just took over. Now during his reign, he spread the power of Mali by conquering territories. He conquered Gyo or Gao as some of you call it and all the people of the Sudan stood in awe of the power of Mali. But all was not well in the kingdom. Why? Well, Sakara was killed on his way home from Hajj. Now I know that you're not naive enough to believe that the royal family was just going to sit back and let Sakara, a servant who usurped the throne, just bask in all of this glory, do you? Next up is Q, Mansa Q, who officially brought the throne back to the royal bloodline. Then Mansa Muhammad, the son of Mansa Q. Now, what I want you to do is add up the years of rulership between Mansa Q and his son Mansa Muhammad. After the murder of the throne usurper Sepkara, these two were obviously also murdered. And guess who's next to sit on the throne? Our guy Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa, the man of the hour. Now, what's interesting is not that things seem to have stabilized during his reign and he ruled for 20 plus years and he made the great hodge. What's interesting is he decided to cause more chaos by leaving his son Mansa Maga in charge and give him the throne. Now, I want you to guess what happened to Mansa Maga after four years of rulership. Remember, Maga just only means Muhammad. But what happened to Mansa Maga after four years of rulership? That's right, you guessed it, Mansa Maga was killed by his uncle Mansa Suleiman. And shortly afterwards, Ibn Butala visits Mali and gives his account of what's going on. If you read Ibn Butala's account, you know that Mansa Suleiman was having problems with one of his wives. Why? Well, she was attempting to help the son of Mansa Maga. Thus, this murdering process starts all over again. But Mansa Suleiman ruled for 24 years. And then he passed the rulership to his son, Kesa. Kesa was killed after nine months by Mansa Maga's son, Mary Jada. But this presentation is about Mansa Musa. So let's move forward. The Sudan disliked Mansa Suleiman on account of his avarice. Before him, there was Mansa Maga. And before Mansa Maga, Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was generous and virtuous. He liked white men and treated them kindly. It was he who gave to Abu Ishaq al Sahili in a single day 4,000 mythicals. Reliable persons have informed me that he gave to Mudrik Aben Fakus 3,000 mythicals in a single day. His grandfather, Sarik Jada, embraced Islam at the hands of the grandfather of this Mudrik. This fiqh Mudrik informed me that a man from Thlemcen 
called I Ben Isaac Aleven, had made a gift to Sultan Mansa Musa in his youth of seven mythicals. At that time, Mansa Musa was a boy without influence. Then it happened that when he had become the Sultan Mudrik, came to him about a dispute. Mansa Musa recognized him and brought him so close to himself that he sat with him on the bandy. Then he made him admit the kindness which he had done to him and said to the emirs, What should be the reward of one who has done the good deed that he has done? They said, For a kind is ten times the like thereof, so give him seventy mythicals. Thereupon he gave him seven hundred mythicals and a robe of honor and slaves of both sexes and ordered him not to cut himself off from him. The son of the aforementioned not being Ashek Aleppin, who was a scholar teaching the Quran in Mali, also told me this story. Farbo Maga, he is of one of those who made the pilgrimage with the Sultan Mansa Musa. Farbo Maga informed me that when Mansa Musa arrived at this channel, he had with him a Kadi, a white man whose kunya was Abu Abbas, known as Abu Kali. He bestowed on him 4,000 mythicals for his expenses. When they reached Mima, he explained to the Sultan that 4,000 mythicals had been stolen from him from his house. The Sultan summoned the Amir of Mima and threatened him with, the death, with death if he did not produce the one who had stolen them. The Amir looked for the thief but found nobody, for no thief is to be found in the country. So he entered the Kadi's house and coerced his servants and threatened them. So one of Dukali's slave girls told him he hasn't lost anything. He has just buried them with his own hands in that place. She indicated the place to him and the Amir got them out and took them to the Sultan and told him the to tale. He was enraged with the Kadi and banished him to the land of the infidels who eat mankind. He stayed among them for four years. Then he was returned to his own country. The infidels refrained from eating him simply because he was white. For they say that the eating of a white man is harmful because he has not yet matured. In their opinion, the black man is the matured one. All right, now this one is just a, a copy or well, the original from one of the chronicles that I read from earlier. So ain't no point of me reading it again. The Amir Abu Hassan Ali Ibn Amir Hajib told me that he was often in the company of Sultan Musa, the king of this country when he came to Egypt on the pilgrimage. He was staying in the Karefa, the district of Cairo, and Abin Amir Hajib was governor of Old Cairo and Karefa at that time. A friendship grew up between them, and this Sultan Musa told him a great deal about himself and his country and the people of the Sudan who were his neighbors. One of the things which he told him was that his country was very extensive and contiguous with the ocean. By his sword and his armies, he had conquered 24 cities each with the surrounding district with villages and estates. It is a country rich in livestock, cattle, sheep, goats, horses, mules, and different kinds of poetry, geese, doves, chickens. The inhabitants of his country are numerous, a vast concourse, but compared with the people of the Sudan who are their neighbors and penetrate far to the south, they are like a white birthmark on a black cow. He has a truce with the gold plant people who pay him tribute. Ibn Amir Hajib said that he asked him about the gold plant, and he said it is found in two forms. One is found in the spring and blossoms after the rains in open country. It has leaves like the Nigel grass, and its roots are gold. The other kind is found all the year round at known sites on the banks of the Nile and is dug up. There are holes there and roots of gold are found like stones or gravel and gathered up. Both kinds are known as Tildra, but the first is of superior fineness and worth more. Sultan Musa told Ibn Amir Ajib that gold was his prerogative and he collected the crop as a tribute except for what the people of that country took by theft. But what al Dukali says is that in fact he is given only a part of it as a present by way of gaining his favor, and he makes a profit on the sale of it, for they have none in their country, and what the Kali says is more reliable. Ibn Amir Hajib said also that the blazing of this king is yellow on the red grounds. Standards are unfurled over him wherever he rides on horseback. They are very big flags. 
the ceremonial for he who presents himself to the king or receives a favor is that he bears the front of his head and makes the juke beating gesture towards the ground with his right hand as the Tartars do. If a more profound obeisance is required, he grovels before the king. I have seen this, says Ibn Amirajab, with my own eyes. A custom of this sultan is that he does not eat in the presence of anybody, be he who he may, but he eats always alone. And it is a custom of his people that if one of them should have reared a beautiful daughter, he offers her to the king as a concubine, and he possesses her without a marriage ceremony as slaves are possessed. And this in spite of the fact that Islam has triumphed among them, and that they followed the Malachite school, and that this Sultan Musa was pious and assiduous in prayer, Quran reading, and mentioned God. I said to him, said I being Amir Hajab, that this was not permissible for a Muslim, were in law or reason. And he said, not even for kings? And I replied, no, not even for kings. Ask the scholars. He said, by God, I did not know that. I hereby leave it and abandon it utterly. I saw that this Sultan Musa loved virtue and people of virtue. He left his kingdom and appointed as his deputy there his son Muhammad and immigrated to God and his messenger. He accomplished the obligations of the pilgrimage, visited the tomb of the prophet at Medina, God's blessing and peace be upon him, and returned to his country with the intention of handing over his sovereignty to his son and abandoning it entirely to him and returning to Mecca the venerated to remain there as a dweller near the sanctuary. But death overtook him. May God, who is great, have mercy upon him. I asked him if he had enemies with whom he fought wars, and he said, Yes, we have a violent enemy who is to the Sudan as the Tartars are to you. They have an analogy with the Tartars in various respects. They are wide in the face and flat-nosed. They shoot well with bow and arrows. Their horses are crossbred with slit noses. Battles take place between us and they are formidable because of their accurate shooting. War between us has its ups and downs. Aben Amir Hajib continued, I asked Sultan Musa how the kingdom fell to him and he said, we belong to a house which hands on the kingship by inheritance. The king, who was my predecessor, did not believe that it was impossible to discover the farthest limit of the Atlantic Ocean and wished vehemently to do so. So he equipped 200 ships filled with men and the same number equipped with gold, water, and provisions enough to last them for years, and said to the man deputed to leave them, Do not return until you reach the end of it or your provisions and water give out. They departed and a long time passed before anyone came back. Then one ship returned and we asked the captain what news they brought. He said, yes, old sultan. We traveled for a long time until there appeared in the open sea, as it were, a river with a powerful current. Mine was the last of those ships. The other ships went on ahead, but when they reached their place, they did not return and no more was seen of them and we do not know what became of them. As for me, I went about it once and did not enter that river, but the sultan disbelieved him. Then the sultan got rid of 2,000 ships, 1,000 for himself and the men whom he took with him, and 1,000 for water and provisions. He left me to deputize for him and embarked on the Atlantic Ocean with his men. That was the last we saw of him and all those who were with him, and so I became king in my own right. This Sultan Musa, during his stay in Egypt, both before and after his journey to the noble Hejaz, maintained a uniform attitude of worship and turning towards God. It was as though he were standing before him because of his continual presence in his mind. He and all those with him behaved in the same manner and were well dressed, grave and dignified. He was noble and generous and performed many acts of charity of kindness. He had left his country with a hundred loads of gold which he spent during his pilgrimage on the tribes who lay along his route from his country to Egypt. While he was in Egypt, he pledged his credit with the merchants at a very high rate of gain so that they made 700 dinars profit on 300. Later, he paid them back amply. He sent to me 500 mythicals of gold by way of honorarium. The currency in the land of Turquoise consists of cowries and the merchants whose principal import these are make big profits on them. Here ends what Abiy and Amir Hijab said. From the beginning of my coming to stay in Egypt, I heard talk of the arrival of this Sultan Musa, 
on his pilgrimage and found the Kearneys eager to recount what they had seen of the Africans. Paradoxical spending. I asked the Emir Abu Abbas Ahmed al Haq, the Mahamanda, and he told me of the opulence, manly virtues, and piety of this of this Sultan. When I went out to meet him, he said, that is on behalf of the mighty Sultan Al Maluk al Nasir. He did me extreme honor and treated me with the greatest courtesy. He addressed me, however, only through an interpreter, despite his perfect ability to speak in the Arabic tongue. Then he forwarded to the royal treasury many loads of worked native gold and other valuables. I tried to persuade him to go up to the citadel to meet the Sultan, but he refused persistently, saying, I came for the pilgrimage and nothing else. I do not wish to mix anything else with my pilgrimage. He had begun to use this argument, but I realized that the audience was repugnant to him because he would be obliged to kiss the ground and the Sultan's hand. I continued to cajole him and he continued to make excuses, but the Sultan's protocol demanded that I should bring him into the royal presence, so I kept on at him till he agreed. When we came in the Sultan's presence, we said to him, kiss the ground, but he refused outright saying, how may this be? Then an intelligent man who was with him whispered to him something we could not understand and he said, I make obeisance to God who created me. Then he prostrated himself and went forward to the Sultan. The Sultan half rose to greet him and set him by his side. They conversed together for a long time. Then Sultan Musa went out. The Sultan sent in him several complete suits of honor himself, his courtiers and all those who had come with him and settled and bridled horses for himself and his chief courtiers. His robe of honor consisted of an Alexandrian open-fronted cloak embellished with torth washcloth, containing much gold thread and miniver fur, bordered with beaver fur, and embroidered with metallic thread, along with golden fastenings, a sword, a kerchief, with pure gold, standards, and two horses settled and bridled and equipped with decorated mural-type saddles. He also furnished him with accommodation and abundant supplies during his stay. When the time to leave for the pilgrimage came round, the Sultan sent to him a large sum of money for ordinary and thoroughbred camels, complete with saddles and equipment to serve his mounts for him, and purchased abundant supplies for his entourage and others who had come with him. He arranged for deposits of father to be placed along the road and ordered the caravan commanders to treat him with honor and respect. On his return, I received him and supervised his accommodation. The Sultan continued to supply him with provisions and lodgings, and he sent gifts from the noble Hejiz to the Sultan as a blessing. The Sultan accepted them and sent in exchange complete suits of honor for him and his courtiers together with gifts, various kinds of Alexandrian cloth and other precious objects. Then he returned to his country. This man flooded Cairo with his benefactions. He left no court emir nor holder of a royal office without the gift of a load of gold. The Karanis made incalculable profits out of him and his food, and buying and selling and giving and taking. They exchanged gold until they depressed his value in Egypt and caused his price to fall. The Mohammedar spoke the truth, for more than one has told this story. When the Mohammedar died, the tax office found among the property which he left thousands of dinars worth of native gold, which he had given to him, still just as it had been in the earth, never having been worked. Merchants of Mizra and Cairo have told me of the profits which they made from the Africans, saying that one of them might buy a shirt or clothes or robe or other garment for five dinars when it was not worth one. Such was their simplicity and trustfulness that it was possible to practice any deception on them. They greeted anything that was said to them with credulous acceptance, but later they formed the very poorest opinions of the Egyptians. Because of the obvious falseness of everything they said to them and their outrageous behavior in fixing the prices of the provisions and other goods which were sold to them. So much so that if they were to encounter today the most learned doctor of religious science and he were to say that he was an Egyptian, they would be rude to him and view him with disfavor because of the ill treatment which they had experienced at their hand. Al Jerumi, the guide, informed me that he accompanied Sultan Musa when he made the pilgrimage 
and that the Sultan was very open-handed toward the pilgrims and the inhabitants of the holy places. He and his companions maintained great pomp and dressed magnificently during the journey. He gave away much wealth and alms. About 200 mythicals of gold fell to me, said Mahana, and he gave other sums to my companions. Mahana waxed eloquent in describing the Sultan's generosity, magnanimity, and opulence. Gold was at a high price in Egypt until they came in that year. The mythical did not go below 25 dirhams and was generally above. But from that time its value fell and it cheapened in price and has remained cheap till now. The mythical does not exceed 22 dirhams or less. This has been the state of affairs for about 12 years and to this day by reason of the large amount of gold which they brought into Egypt and spent there. A letter came from this sultan to the court of the sultan in Cairo. It was written in the Maghrebi style of handwriting on paper with wide lines. In it, he follows his own rules of composition, although observing the demands of propriety. It was written by the hand of one of his courtiers who had come on the pilgrimage. Its contents comprised greetings and a recommendation for the bearer. With it, he sent 5,000 mythicals of gold by way of a gift. The countries of Mali and Ghana and their neighbors are reached from the west side of Upper Egypt. The route passes by way of the oasis through desert country inhabited by Arab and then Berber communities until cultivated country is reached by way of Moradian as the mountains of the Berbers to the south of Marrakesh and are joined to them by long stretches of wilderness and extensive desolate deserts. The learned fork Abu Ruf the Zawawi informed me that the Sultan Mansa Musa told him that the length of his kingdom was about a year's journey, and Ibn Amir Hajib told me the same. Al-Dukali's version, already mentioned, is that it is four months' journey long by the same in breath. What Al-Dukali says is more to be relied on, for Mansa Musa possibly exaggerated the importance of his realm. As a way, we also said, this Sultan Musa told me that at a town called this undecipherable, he has a copper mine from which ingots are brought to indecipherable. There is nothing in my kingdom, he said, on which a duty is levied, except this crude copper which is brought in. Duty is collected on this and, not, and on nothing else. We send it to the land of the pagan Sudan and sell it for two-thirds of its weight in gold, so that we sell 100 mythicals of this copper for 66 two-thirds mythicals of gold. He also stated that there are pagan nations in his kingdom from whom he does not collect the tribute, but whom he simply employs in extracting the gold from his deposits. The gold is extracted by digging pits about a man's height and depth, and the gold is found embedded in the sides of the pits, or sometimes collected at the bottom of them. The king of this country wages a permanently holy war on the pagans of the Sudan, who are his neighbors. They are more numerous than could ever be counted. al Dakali said to me, the people of this kingdom make much use of magic and poison. They take great interest in them and are very exact in them. They have plants and animals from which they compound fatal poisons, especially a kind of fish which they have in the gallbladders of crocodiles. They are poisons for which there are no antidotes. Now, regardless of everything I just read, this is usually the only thing people are concerned with, the voyage. First, notice the absence of any names in this text. I'm going to show you the text from the book to show you that I didn't alter the text in any way. It should be noted that the authors of this translation did a word-for-word -word translation, and if there's a word they couldn't decipher, they left the word as is, giving you the ability to decipher the word yourself. As you heard me say throughout this presentation, this word or dead word is undecipherable. This is page one. Pause the video and read it for yourself. This is page two. Pause the video again and read it for yourself. To be frank and upfront on this observation, this story is not West African. This is the only account, and if you rewind the presentation and read the account, of Ibn Amir Hajab again, you can see that even Al Yumari doesn't even believe Ibn Amir Hajab and mentions that what Al Dakali says is more reliable. 
This is a variation of a common North African shipwreck story. One of the most famous is Al Idrisi's, written in the 12th century, and even his story is a variation of another older story. The story goes a little like this. Some brothers were pecking for a voyage in the big waters. They made their way out to sea and happened to come across a river in the sea. This river took them away. Now, I'm pretty sure this sounds familiar. Another version states, This river in the sea took them someplace with brown people, and they were arrested. One day a person speaking Arabic came to see them. Now, if you're an extreme Afrocentric, I guarantee you, you've heard a version of this story. Guaranteed. The reality is, these people landed in North Africa, and they started their journey from the Al-Andalus, a couple months journey away from their home, and not on a new continent. Now, I kept asking you, is there anything missing or strange? I asked that because I purposely read the two chronicles from the Western Sudan first. Why? Well, because these accounts were written in the 17th century, well after al Umari's account, the authors of the two chronicles were well aware of Umari's, al Umari's writings. They didn't mention this voyage at all, and they are from the area and would have been well aware of such a voyage. They also remained quiet on how Mansa Musa came to power, similar to how they remained quiet to the exact death of Sunni Ali. Now, if you're a student of the Orient or you study Arabic texts, you know for a fact if there is a potential blemish in their history, they won't mention it. Just like a griot or a storyteller will not mention anything negative of their favorite kings. Now, for all of the emotional people involved in this, you may be wondering where did this Al Bakari the second character come from? And then comes the oral evidence in Mali. They speak of a king Abu Bakari II, who wanted to cross the ocean because he felt there was land beyond, and he appears, the Mexicans report this strange black man in white robes appearing, and it is also reported by the Arabs because Mansa Musa went to Cairo, he's a Muslim, and he went to Cairo, when he was in Cairo, he talked about, they asked him, what happened to your brother? And he told him that he wanted to cross the ocean and he never came back. And it's recorded by the Arabs in al Kashandi and the Masili Kalabsar, Fir Mamili Kalamsar. So that's the documented evidence. Then there's the iconographic evidence. So I've presented 12 pieces of evidence. Eyewitness accounts, methodological evidence, linguistic evidence, botanical evidence, oceanographic evidence. The court tradition of Mali in documents in Cairo tell of an African king, Abu Bukhari II, setting out on the Atlantic in 1311. He commandeered a fleet of large boats, well stocked with food and water, and embarked from the Senegambia coast, the western borders of this West African empire, entering the Canaries Currents, a river in the middle of the sea, as the captain of a preceding fleet of which only one boat returned, described it. Neither of the two Mandingo fleets came back to Mali to tear their story. But around this time, evidence of contact between West Africans and Mexicans appeared in strata in America in an overwhelming combination of artifacts and cultural parallels. Now, I said some things about this book. I retired it. I said, leave it alone. But let's see what someone else said about this book in the 1970s. This is from Ronald Davis. He states, when referring about Ivan Van Sertimus, they came before Columbus. Unfortunately, however, his work is a strenuous attempt to extend the boundaries of absurdity and a genre which has never attracted much rigorous scholarship in the best of times. Africanist who read they came before Columbus will come away convinced that the manuscript was never seriously critiqued. In fact, its content and format raised questions about the motivations of everyone involved, from the author to his publishers, in marketing a relatively expensive, useless publication. 
Van Sertima tries to rehabilitate Leo Wiener, but he quickly departs from any such discernible focus as Wiener or the Mali and Tail. The result is a skirter gun approach, a naive diffusionism of the type that once graced much of the Eurocentric worldview. Van Sertima simply takes the hoary notions such as an Egyptian stimulus for Mesoamerican architecture and applies the tar brush. Quasi Cota, for example, an Irish monk or a Welsh explorer for other theorists is black for Van Sertima. Spray painting the old diffusionist interpretations, of course, is not original with Van Sertima. Uh-oh. Shank Gata Diop and Eva Yosef Ben Cannon display much more sophisticated versions of black diffusionism than this author, whose definition of a Negro Egyptian racial type rests on the appearance of a peculiar coiffure facial geography, and expression. Only an argument such as this could allow him to suggest that an Aztec god is black on the grounds that its likeness is sculpted in green stone with kinky hair made of solid gold. I'm not going to jump on Van Sertima. What I'm going to do is show some growth and some wisdom because it's easy to tear something down. There is no wisdom in that. What I can do is attempt to help out by showing where the Van Sertima confusion comes from. If you have the original version of They Came Before Columbus, the original print from the 1970s, the version that cost $100, that version doesn't have any sources or references in it. But if you have one of the more recent publications, like the $12 version off of Amazon, that version has sources in it. One of the sources is A History of Islam in West Africa by Spencer Tremingham. If you read the text where the arrow is pointing, you can clearly see that Tremingham has the king's list wrong. He has Abu Bakr out of order and coming after Selkara, instead of the other way around. In short, this king procession is wrong and has no supporting evidence. This is one of the sources that Van Sertima used. And because Tremingham is wrong, Van Sertima is also wrong. Here is another view of the King's List for you to compare it with the last image. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm done. You just partake in the book of information regarding Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was light work. With Askiel the Great, I'm going to introduce you to the knowledge and wisdom of West Africa. We're going to step it up a notch. I'm going to impart on you some wisdom that you will surely remember.